Welcome to PALS. It's from Sanyamu's Anatomy Lecture Series. In this place, our goal is to make anatomy simple. If you're just joining us, you have not subscribed. We would like you to subscribe now and be part of this amazing anatomy family. We have been discussing the gross anatomy of the heart, the components of the center features such as surfaces, borders, apex, base, groove, sulci. We have also looked at the four chambers and the valves in our earlier lectures. This is part three and in this part we'll consider the arterial blood supply to the heart and some clinical correlates associated with the heart. So let's go to class. The coronary arteries are the first branches of the aorta. And then when we discuss the aortic sinuses, we noted that the right and left coronary arteries arise from the corresponding aortic sinus at the proximal part of the ascending aorta, just superior to the opposite sides. So they will originate from this aortic sinuses and then pass to the opposite sides of the pulmonary trunk. Now in this image, we are seeing the two coronary arteries. This is the right coronary artery here. And then this is the left coronary artery. We are seeing the faded image here shows it is seen behind the pulmonary trunk. We will start with the right coronary artery. As you noted, it picks origin from the right aortic sinus. So here is the right coronary artery, and then we have the right aortic sinus, we have the left, and we have the posterior. From this origin, let's look at this image. It will run downwards in the groove here. Remember, we call this groove the right coronary sulcus or the right atrioventricular groove it will run in this groove and at the beginning part we we'll see it giving out a branch it usually gives off this branch called the ascending sinatral nodal branch and this branch will rise to supply the sa node the right coronary artery will continue in the coronary sulcus and give off another branch. And this branch is called the right marginal branch. So this is the right marginal branch. This right marginal branch will supply the right border of the heart and it will run towards to the apex of the heart. We can see it's running on the right border of the heart towards the apex of the heart. It usually does not get to the apex of the heart. After giving off this branch, the right coronary artery will turn to the left and continue in the right posterior coronary sulcus to the posterior aspect of the heart. This is the right marginal artery, as we've noted. After giving off this branch, it will continue into the posterior aspect of the right coronary sulcus and it will get to the point of the heart that is called the crux of the heart. This part is the part that's called the crux of the heart. It's the junction of the interatrial and interventricular septa. This is the point here. At this point, the right coronary artery will give rise to the atrioventricular nodal branch, which will supply the AV node. That means we've seen this branch giving two contributions to these conducting fibers, the SA node and the AV node. It will also continue to give rise to another very significant branch. What is this branch? This branch is called the posterior interventricular branch. So here is the posterior interventricular branch. This branch will descend in the posterior interventricular groove and will move towards the apex of the heart. Here is the posterior interventricular groove. This is the groove. This is the groove. This is the groove here. This artery, after giving off this large posterior interventricular branch, will continue here as the terminal branch, or what is also called the left ventricular branch of the right coronary artery, which will continue for a short distance in the coronary sulcus. Typically, the right coronary artery will supply the right atrium, 
it will supply the right ventricle, part of the left ventricle, particularly the diaphragmatic surface, that is part, some part here. It will also supply part of the interventricular septum, and this is usually the posterior thought. We noted the first branch that will supply the SA node, and this is in approximately 60% of the people. And then we also noted the branch that supplied the AV node, and this is in about 80% of the people. We will next look at the left coronary artery. This is the left coronary artery. As we also noted, it peaks origin from the left aortic sinus of the ascending aorta. It will pass between the left auricle, here is the left auricle, here is the left auricle, and the left side of the pulmonary trunk. And then as it does so, it will run into the coronary sulcus, which is the left coronary sulcus. So this is the sulcus. Remember, it's a sulcus between the left ventricle and then the left atrium. From the coronary sulcus, at the superior end of the anterior interventricular groove, this artery will divide into two terminal branches. Here are the two terminal branches. At this point, we we'll see this is one branch, this one branch here, this one branch here, and then this another branch here. So these are the two terminal branches. What are the names of these branches? Here we have the, the left anterior descending artery, and then we see here the left circumflex artery. So these two arteries will be the terminal branches of the left coronary artery. In approximately 40% of the people, the S another branch will arise from the circumflex branch of the left coronary artery and will ascend on the posterior surface of the left atrium to the SA node. Now the anterior interventricular branch, that is the branch we are seeing here, will pass along the interventricular groove to the apex of the heart. At the apex of the heart, it will turn around the inferior border of the heart and will commonly anastomose with the posterior interventricular branch of the right coronary artery. So we have that anastomosis somewhere around here. The anterior interventricular branch, this branch we are seeing here, will give rise to a lateral branch which is also called diagonal artery. So here is the diagonal artery which will descend on the anterior surface of the heart. This branch, the left marginal branch of the circumflex branch, will follow the left margin of the heart and will supply the left ventricle. Most commonly, the circumflex branch of the left coronary artery will terminate in the coronary sulcus on the posterior aspect of the heart before reaching the crux of the heart. Here we see the circumflex branch on the left coronary sulcus entering the posterior aspect of the left coronary sulcus. So usually the circumflex branch that will enter this posterior surface of the heart will not get to the cross of the heart here. But sometimes when it does, it will give a branch that will either run in this posterior interventricular groove or that will run along the section of the posterior interventricular groove. Typically, the left coronary artery will supply the left atrium, the left ventricle, part of the right ventricle, and most of the interventricular septum, usually it anterior to third. Recall that the right coronary artery will supply the posterior one third. We have some variations in the formation of the coronary artery. Coronary arterial dominance is defined by which artery, whether it is a right coronary artery or the left coronary artery, that will give a branch that will be seen in this posterior interventricular groove. So the dominance is determined by which artery actually gives the branch seen here. Right dominance is most common and it can be seen in 67% of the individuals. We also have a case where we have both contributions from right coronary artery and left coronary artery. 
In this case, we call the system co-dominance. So in co-dominance, we have about 18% of the persons having this uh, system. While in about 15% of the people, we have a branch of the circumflex artery, which is a branch of the left coronary artery, giving the branch in this interventricular groove. A few people have only one coronary artery. And in other people, the circumflex branch, which is a branch that usually picks origin from the left coronary artery, will be seen picking origin from the right aortic sinus. We also see 4% of the people having an accessory coronary artery. In this section, we will give consideration to some of the clinical correlates. The first one we will be discussing is myocardial infarction. What is myocardial infarction? In simple words, it's heart attack. It's a necrosis of the myocardium because of local ischemia, loss of oxygen supply, which will come as a result of vasospasm or obstruction of the blood supply. And this is most commonly by a thrombus or embolus in the coronary artery. Let's look at this view here. In this view, we are seeing the coronary artery and we are seeing plagues that are obstructing the smooth flow of blood within the coronary artery. There are symptoms that are associated. One, we notice chest pain or pressure and this will last for about 30 minutes or more. Okay, we also have congestive heart failure and then murmur of mitral regurgitations. Another condition we would like to consider is angina pectoris. This is chest pain originating in the heart and felt beneath the sternum. In many cases, this will radiate to the left shoulder and even down to the arm. How is it caused? It is also caused by insufficient supply of oxygen to the heart muscles due to coronary artery disease or one exertion either via exercise or excitement or emotion via stress, anger or frustration. Here in this illustration, we are seeing the heart not having enough oxygen as a result of narrowing of the coronary artery which now elicits some of the symptoms we've mentioned from pressing, squeezing or crushing pain usually in the chest or under the sternum. We can also notice these pains along the upper back, both arms, neck or even ear lobes. We can see these pains radiating in, our, in the arms, shoulders, jaw, neck or back. And then this also accompanied with shortness of breath, weakness, fatigue and dizziness. Now we consider the mitral valve prolapse. In mitral valve prolapse, there is an eversion of the valve into the left atrium and this will cause an improper closure of the orifice when the left ventricle contracts. Now let's look at this. In this opening, we see a normal mitral valve. Now in this image, we are seeing a valve that has everted into the left atrium and when this valve closes, there will be improper closure and we we'll see blood leaking, leaking into the atrium giving rise to mitral regurgitation. It will produce chest pain, shortness of breath, palpitation and even cardiac arrhythmia. We we'll look at endocarditis. Endocarditis is inflammation of the endocardium as a result of infection of the endocardium of the heart. And then this is most commonly involving the heart valves. It is caused by cluster of bacteria on the valves. Let's look at our picture. Now in this picture we see these clusters of bacteria on the valves leading to the inflammation. This happens because the valves do not receive any blood supply and the white blood cells cannot enter and so they have no defense mechanism which is offered by the white blood cells. So we see some of these symptoms such as fatigue, weakness, fever, night sweats, anorexia, heart murmur, 
and sharpness of breath. Some of the risk factors include damaged or abnormal heart valves, mitral valve prolapse, and certain congenital heart defects. Another condition we would like to discuss is cardiac murmur. Cardiac murmur is, is a normal thing in individuals, particularly in the newborn. This is sound generated by turbulence of blood as it passes through an orifice of the heart. But we have conditions where this can be pathological. So murmurs caused by heart diseases are called pathological murmurs. How do they occur? They occur when the blood travels through a leaky or narrowed heart valve. As we can notice in this picture, here we are having, having a valve prolapse leading to valve regurgitation. Alongside the heart conditions that I have given rise to this condition leading to cardiac murmur, the patient can express some of these symptoms such as leg swelling, fatigue, lightheadedness, or even chest pressure, particularly when the individual is active. We will consider coronary atherosclerosis next. This is a condition where we have so much sclerotic plaques containing cholesterol and lipoid materials that can impair flow of blood to the heart and this will lead to ischemia and myocardial infarction. Let us look at our two images. Here we see the normal artery. At this stage we see the fatty streak gathering. At this point we are seeing formation of mature plaque and at this point already there is formation of uh, thrombosis. Here too we are seeing normal flow. Now we are seeing the mature plaques and here we are almost having total blockade of this flu and thrombosis. We will consider coronary angioplasty next. Coronary angioplasty is an angiographic reconstruction of a blood vessel which is made by enlarging a narrow coronary arterial lumen. The essence is to enlarge a lumen that is very narrow. This is performed by peripheral introduction of a balloon tip catheter and dilation of the lumen on withdrawal of the inflated catheter tip. In this our image, we can see the, the lumen that is narrowed by plaques, and here we can see the balloon tip catheter introduced to this lumen. Usually a metal stent is often placed during this angioplasty. We will consider coronary bypass. Coronary bypass is a surgical procedure that involves connection of a section of vessel, usually the saphenous vein or the internal thoracic artery or other conduit between the aorta and a coronary artery distal to an obstruction in the coronary artery, thereby shunting blood from the aorta to the coronary arteries. So what this does is to shunt blood away from a part of the channel that's already blocked. Here we are seeing saphenous vein bypass in this image and here we are seeing left internal mammary artery bypass. At this point we are seeing a blockade and then this is a shunt that is avoiding this blockade. This is where we end this part of the lecture. If you have questions, comments and suggestions, please drop them in the comment section. If you consider this material helpful, we encourage you to subscribe, like our video, and share it to your friends that it will also be helpful to. And together, we will build a unique anatomy family where we make anatomy simple. See you in my next